Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Be Bold America. I'm your host, Jill Cody, along with my co-host, Dr. Pettis Perry. Hey, Pettis, how are you today? I'm doing really well today. It's a glorious day here in the Pacific Northwest. How are you doing, my friend? I am doing great in the 72 degrees in California. Yeah, tease me, tease me, tease me. <laughs> Every week I get to, you know, neener, neener. <laughs> well, we have a very special program today in honor of Earth Day and Earth Month. We have a friend of Pettis's on the program, and I am very excited to meet him on air. His name is Captain Pete Bethune. When I read about Captain Bethune and watched his TED Talk titled, Find a Cause Worth Dying For, I realized he is a real Indiana Jones. Not a Hollywood made-up character, but a real Indiana Jones of endangered species. He's been run over by, shot at by illegal gold miners and knifed in the chest while following the illegal pet trade in Costa Rica. He is astonishing. And we need people like him in the world who will fight for those endangered species who can't fight for themselves. Our future depends on it. I won't go on and on because I could. But we want to hear directly from Captain Bethune himself. So, Pettis, why don't you introduce our special guest? It's my absolute pleasure. Welcome, Captain Pete. How are you doing today? Pettis, it is good to be back with you, bro. I'm doing, I'm doing really good down here in uh, Costa Rica and just got the sun dipping down over the horizon. Oh, you too. Tease, tease. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, it's really good to hear your voice. Um, I, I just want to let people know how we met, uh, and then we'll roll right into talking about all the great stuff that you're doing. Uh, Pete and I had a chance to uh, meet during a transition uh, at the time he purchased the MODOK, which is a former uh, deep sea uh, Navy tug. And uh, we spent several months together uh, on the boat as he was beginning to retrofit it for a trip uh, to the dry docks uh, where he uh, was able to put it together. And uh, it's now sailing in the ocean. I'm very excited to hear about what you're uh, you know, what you've been doing. Uh, but before we get into that, Pete, uh, how are you doing, man? Uh, we know that uh, you ran into a very nasty uh, snake in the jungles uh, and that you were bitten. Uh, so can you give us an update on how you're doing physically and how uh, your crew is holding up with all the COVID stuff on top of everything else? Yeah, look, the uh, the snake bites was a, a snake called a fertilance, and it put me on the back of the calf. But I barely notice it now. Like my my left leg is fractionally bigger than my right leg, but in terms of strength and agility and that, it's basically back to where it was. So, um, you know, I'm one of the very lucky ones. The fertilance that kills uh, it kills more more people in Central and South America than any other snake. And there was a a ranger in Costa Rica died last year within 10 minutes of being bitten and it took me three hours to get to hospital so I'm a wow. I'm a very lucky man to be alive and I'm even more blessed that, that my leg is healed up okay and I've got all this sort of movement back um, and in terms of Costa Rica where we are with Corona this has been a great place to ride out the, the Corona circus like the, the people here are very diligent wearing their masks are very good on social distancing and while it has affected the population it hasn't really affected us on the ship. Uh, and so it's, it's largely been sort of, you know, life is, as, as normal as my, my life would get down here and my, my crew's all safe and sound and none of us have had corona. That's outstanding. Uh, I know Jill it can't wait to start asking you some questions. So, Jill? I think all of us would want to hear about what it's like to be run over by a Japanese whaling boat stabbed in the chest, bitten by the most dangerous snake in South America. Have you been shot yet, Pete? No, I haven't been shot. I've been uh, I've been very blessed on that side too. I've been shot at a few times now, but uh, often it's people who are running who maybe got gold mining illegally or poaching illegally, and they run away, firing over their shoulder. And, and thus far, me and my team have managed to avoid it. But um, it, it, it comes with the territory a little bit. And I'm 
you know, the work I do is often assisting rangers and they're exposed to those risks every day and because I'm a little white boy from New Zealand doesn't give me a free pass. Um, <laughs> and so I, I, I take on those risks just as, as the many rangers do, you know. I just, I, I did think of that because it seems you've experienced just about everything else. <laughs> I was curious. So... Um, Tell us about your boat being run over by a Japanese whaling vessel. Um, that was a pretty beautiful boat, too. I saw it on the website, and I know later you were arrested um, by the Japanese government. And whatever you can tell us about being arrested and what it was like in, in their jail, uh, we would love to hear. Yeah, that was, those were crazy days back then. So I, I built this boat called Earth Race, which was a, a trimaran. Sort of looked a little bit like Batman's boat. And uh, it was an extraordinary vessel. We could, we could take it over halfway around the world on one one tank of fuel. It was extremely fuel efficient. And then we, we set a record for circling the globe, running 100% biodiesel made from waste cooking oils. And at the end of that, the sponsor promotions and things, I started to... I guess lose interest or, or lose my passion for biofuels and at the time the biofuels industry was busy switching to palm oil as their major feedstock and as a, as a conservationist that wasn't really something that, that I could continue supporting so and at the same time I'd spent this three years on this recall boat travelling the oceans and starting to, to witness firsthand the problems that the oceans and seas were starting to face and so I was wanting to get involved in marine conservation I had this very cool boat called Earth Race and I got approached by Sea Shepherd uh, to go down to Antarctica and help try and stop Japanese whaling. And so this was 2009. We painted the boat black, put some, put a couple of Sea Shepherd logos on it. A guy, Addy Gill, came in and, and funded the transition. And in December 2010, took the boat down to Antarctica chasing Japanese whalers. And we, technically, a lot of what we did was illegal down there. Um, and under, under maritime law, for example, you're not allowed to disrupt a vessel engaged in fishing, whether you believe it's fishing legally or not. Um, and so we, we got down there and, and certainly did a pretty decent job of, of disrupting their whaling. We cost them a lot of money in terms of preventing them from whaling for a significant period of time. Uh, and then at one of the stages, I was, I was very low on fuel and I was going to be waiting a couple of days for another Sea Shepherd vessel to come and refuel me. And we had, we had spent the morning trying to slow the Nishin Maru, which is a processing ship, slowing it down a little bit. And as we were sitting there in the water, the security vessel, the Shonen Maru, which we'd had a few altercations with prior to this, came sliding by us. And then at the last minute, they turned to starboard and basically ran us over. And the, the front end of the boat was completely sliced off. And at the time, when, when, when it first sort of happened, you know, I, I thought me and my crew were gone. So it was, it was very intimidating. You know, Shonen Maru is an 800-ton vessel, and that just came down and sliced our boat in two. Um, and then we, we um, transferred to another Sea Shepherd vessel, uh, and the boat was it, it potentially could have been recovered, but Sea Shepherd, who, who now sort of had control of the boat, they decided to, to leave it in Antarctica and, and let it sink or rot or whatever. Um, and it was very hard for me to, you know, basically abandon the spoke that had been such a big part of my life for, at this stage, probably five years. Um, and so, so after the after the boat was abandoned. And now it kind of freed me up to board one of the Japanese vessels. Now, keep in mind, what our goal here is to, is to try and get media in Japan over whaling. The ramming of the boat barely made the news. And I remember thinking if we could get back to Japan as a prisoner, it would take the story to Japan. So uh, it was a month or two later in the middle of the night, I managed to board the Shonen Maru off a jet ski in the middle of the night down in Antarctica. And it's one of the most challenging things I've ever done. And my engineer and I, we, we spent a, about two weeks hatching this plan, how to pull it off, and on the first attempt, I think it was about two in the morning, it was pretty dark, and I and I fell in the water, and miraculously Larry found me with a jet ski about five minutes later, and then second attempt, I managed to managed to get on, and then I, I hid in the boat for about three or four hours until daybreak, and then went and presented the captain of the Shonamaru with a bill for, for three million dollars to <laughs> replace the boat that he'd run over, and, and then as expected, they took me back to Japan as a prisoner, um, and I spent five months in a maximum security prison there, um, 
and and it was it was pretty difficult. But what it did do was it really galvanised public support around the whaling issue. And until now, whaling was a little bit of a non-issue in New Zealand and Australia. And suddenly you had this boat being run over. You had a guy whose boat's been run over, the captain of it, now in prison in Japan with some trumped-up charges. And you had Sea Shepherd, Greenpeace, WWF, a whole series of NGOs all in very effective campaigns leveraging off the exposure that was, was happening. And it put a lot of pressure on New Zealand, Australia, and in the end, Australia announced action against Japan and the International Court of Justice. Four years later, the Japan lost the court case, and a couple of years after that, they withdrew completely from Antarctica. So I'm very proud to say I was I was part of the team that, that in the end, stopped Japanese whaling, and it was only the public support around our activities that really galvanised and pushed the Australian government to take action. Uh, and then back to my time in Japan, when I got out, I was quite a different man, and it, it affected me not altogether in, in good ways. And I remember on, on my first week in prison, uh, the first time I was in the showers and I saw an 18-year-old kid get raped, um, and from there, prison became quite a dark place. And uh, when I came out, I was I was very angry, and I had I, I would sort of lose my temper very quickly. Um, and I, I remember one time I went down to the down to the bank. I got home, and basically I was broke. And I went down, and a friend, a sponsor of mine in the US, said he'd send me ten grand to keep me going. And I went to the bank on the Monday, and the money wasn't in there. And I remember looking at this teller. And I started yelling at it, and I was sizing up whether I could jump across the thing and grab it by the throat. And this is not—I'm not a violent person. I, you know, I, I abhor violence. And and these thoughts were so so strong in my mind. And I remember at the time, the bank manager came out, and he he, he knew who I was, and he said, "Look, Pete, I think it's time you left," and sort of ushered me out. And banks in New Zealand don't have security guards or anything. And so anyway, he ushered me out, and I went sort of fuming down the road yelling a couple of obscenities and I went into a little coffee shop and sat down and and the lady comes over and she said what would you like and and at the time I only had about two dollars eighty in my bank account and a cappuccino was going to cost me three fifty and I'm and I said to the lady I said look could you do me a cappuccino but I've only got two dollars eighty five in my account and then she she said yes and she went away and she bought me back the coffee and gave it to me on the house anyway and I remember sort of thinking like oh, you know you need to get things in perspective like you've just spent the last five months thinking you might have, you're about to be raped or beaten up by some Yakuza gangster. And, you know, if the worst thing in your day is that 10 grand is not in your account, it'll be there tomorrow or Wednesday. And it, and that started a long process for me to try and get over that anger stage and to to, to, to get my mind, mind sort of back in a, in a healthy state. And it probably took about six months, I think. And, you know, gradually I managed to sort of get control of it and put things back in perspective sort of thing. And um, once, I, once I sort of decided where I wanted to go, and this is where I, I often, I, I talk about things, when, when people get to truly work on things they believe in, it's very hard to go back to just earning a living, for example. And that, that is a little bit what happened to me. So I'd set the record to circle the globe. I'd gone down and battled Japanese whalers. And both of those things I'd cared deeply about at the time. And, and now that I no longer had the boat, I was out, out of prison. I actually had a chance for full reset. I could go back and work nine to five and sell washing machines or do some low stress job. But I found it quite, I just couldn't do it. And I remember thinking, you know, I've had a taste of this working on things I'm passionate about. And it's very hard to let that go. And I, my relationship with Sea Shepherd had soured a little bit in, in part over the, what had happened with the boat and, and Paul Watson and I sort of weren't really seeing eye to eye on things. So I, I decided to sort of go out on, on my own and see what I could do. And one of the challenges you, you face in conservation is how you fund your work. And, you know, if you speak with almost all conservationists you ever come across, their biggest challenge is funding. And so I remember pondering this and... One of the things that had happened in Antarctica, there was an Animal Planet show called Whale Wars that had followed us around. And that season, the final episode when I boarded the Shonen Maru became the highest ever rating episode in Animal Planet history. And I remember sort of thinking, you know, maybe there's a way there you can put together a TV show and and, and have that fund your work. And so I, I went around knocking on doors trying to get a bit of money to put together a sizzle and eventually I 
I met a guy who just won lotto in New Zealand and he put in half a million dollars and then I, I won a court case against Sea Shepherd which pulled in another half a million and that was the balance of the boat that, that they'd owed me. Uh, so that gave me a million dollars. I packed up my bags, I hired a whole bunch of former military spec ops guys and came to Costa Rica and filmed a season here and filmed a couple episodes in Africa as well. And so the, the television show just followed me and my men going around doing conservation missions and with you know a bunch of hardcore guys it allowed me to tackle some quite challenging projects and and we had some pretty cool successes we we closed down a couple of illegal gold mining operations we closed down several wildlife smuggling rings we, we exposed the the seal clubbing that happens in Namibia they kill about 100,000 seal pups a year that get mm. made into purses and jackets and stuff uh, we exposed a number of illegal logging operations we delved into the illegal pet trade and so the television show allowed us to highlight these the, the conservation issues that that we believe were important and one of the one of the best ones was the the pangolin at the time no one had ever heard of a pangolin and uh, so we had one episode where we 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 put a, um, a, a series of people under surveillance and also a warehouse under surveillance and eventually got enough evidence to go in and, and um, raid the place with some some local wildlife officers and they had uh, there was a pangolin that we managed to rescue and that place got closed down and the the, um, the owner of it got arrested and stuff and so we did it we did a lot of missions probably the two that that my team would be proudest of one of them was there was a dolphin being held somewhat illegally at an island resort offshore from Indonesia and we snuck into this place at two in the morning and stole their dolphin and took it to an island about 50 k's offshore and rehabilitated it and released it back into the wild. Uh, and it was a it was a pretty gutsy mission. Like some of our missions are, are relatively high risk, but this one there we we risk quite significant prison time if we got caught in there doing that. You know, even though the dolphin is held illegally. Um, and then also the 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 one in Namibia where we broke into a De Beers diamond mine. And again, if you get caught in a diamond mine in Africa, you get shot or you do serious prison time. And we managed to to, to sneak around this diamond mine for four days, trying to film the seal clubbing. And on the last day, we, we ran out of food, ran out of water. We had about a 20 mile hike to get out of there because the the, the weather got so bad we couldn't get an exfil by Zodiac. And on this last day, my team. It was myself and a paratrooper from New Zealand. We managed to film the brutal seal clubbing. And that episode, too, really helped put seal clubbing on the map. And since then, you've sort of seen um, Namibia come under increasing pressure to to stop its seal clubbing industry, which is which is one of the most horrid things you'll ever witness, like a, you know, a bunch of thugs jumping out the back of a car, herding baby seals into, into little wee pens and then clubbing them over the head. Like I did see it on your website. Uh, it was very hard to watch. There is a video there. You are listening to Be Bold America on KSQD 90.7 FM. Many voices, one station. Listen globally online from the ksqd.org homepage. I'm here with my co-host, Pettis Perry, and I'm Jill Cody. Today our topic is the Indiana Jones of Endangered Species, Captain Pete Bethune. Pettis and I are speaking with Captain Pete Bethune, founder of Earth Race, and you may see numerous astonishing videos of him and his team's work, including his e-books, one of which is the story of his around-the-world biodiesel speed record, all found at earthrace.net. And today, um, uh, Captain Pete, I bought both of those seasons. I want to see the uh, the TV show, The Operatives, and I bought both of those seasons. And I am listening to your story of the Japanese prison. My my heart started aching, and I'm I'm just very delighted that you got your being back. You know, the your who ness back after that experience. Yeah, you and me both, Jill. I, I think sometimes in in life, you know, we get we everyone faces challenges in life, and and some of them can can sort of break us, and some of them can help to mould us in what we are. And you know, we're we're all the product of of our upbringing and our DNA and the experiences we have. And I've been I've been very blessed in my life in recent years to experience some extraordinary things and um, things like the. the you know, having gone to Japanese prison, you know, I was a willing participant in that. You know, the objective was to go back to prison in Japan, and I, you know, I did do a bit more prison time than I than I thought I was going to. I thought I'd do about two weeks, <laughs> and then and so the five months, and it became a little bit like Groundhog Day. And the fact that it did impact me in quite a significant way, I'm okay with it. Like when I look at it now, it served a real purpose, and 
you made a big difference. Um, how, Pettis, you there? I am. And Captain Pete, did we lose you? Okay, uh, Pettis, I need to get uh, my engineer to get Captain Pete back. Sorry, I'm back there. My oh, phone there just did a, did a wee jiggle. Oh, we sorry good. about that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in radio, we just always panic when we uh, hear something drop. So, you know, you have a canine unit in Costa Rica, and the dog's name is Appa. And you say it's the backbone, uh, the canine unit is the backbone of a jungle tracking. How does this specially trained canine, what does this specially trained on canine do? And who's the handler? Do, are you the handler? Is that someone else? Um, so, yeah, we got the dog up uh, about three months ago now. There was a, a non-profit in UK called Animals Saving Animals, and they called me up about six months ago and said, hey, you know, we train anti-poaching dogs for Africa. Would you like one of these for, for your team in Costa Rica? And at the time, we'd been doing some missions here trying to stop illegal gold mining in national parks and also wildlife smuggling. And the guys in there really hard to catch. And as an example, if you come down on a legal gold mine, they'll, they'll often have um, lookouts that that spot you and they're well hidden and then they'll quickly run over to the mine and let the miners know and they disappear. So a, a, an anti-poaching dog firstly alerts us that there's someone ahead of us. So we, instead of just stumbling into these people, uh, we get to we get to know there's someone there so we can set up a, our own sort of perimeter around it. And, um, and secondly, it allows us to track poachers. And the poachers in the jungle here are very hard to catch. Um, and the, one of the reasons they're on the move, the gold mines, you know, at least you can, we can detect them with our drone and then we, we might know roughly where they are. And then up a, has a way of making things a lot safer for us. So firstly, we, we, we're aware that the, there might be miners around the corner. Um, secondly, as you come in on a mine, the miners are less likely to do something stupid. Like if you see three or four rangers in front of you, you kind of know what human behaviour is, but the dog, it puts a question in their minds and they say, man, am I going to run? Probably not. I know that dog's going to outrun me. Am I going to pull a gun or pull a knife on these rangers? I've also got a dog that can have me in a second sort of thing. So the dog helps to, to make the operations a lot safer. And so up is, he's still in training. He's... Um, We've had him three months now, and so we take him out a couple of days a week on the patrols here, and uh, he's, he's an amazing dog. I've, he's a breed I've that been... I haven't heard of before. What breed is he? He's a Belgian Malinois. That they look a little bit like a German Shepherd, but with with a darker face. Extremely physical, like like arguably the most physical dog there is. Just super athletes. They've got a very good nose, um, very intelligent. They're easily trained, uh, super hard working. Um, but the sort of a downside with them as pets is they're really high energy, and they've kind of become a little bit fashionable in some circles to have a Belgian Malinois because the army and anti poaching is they use them. They don't really make good family pets for a kid to play with and to be shut in nine hours a day. But as a, as a high energy energy uh, work dog, they're an extraordinary animal, and and he's been such a valuable part to our team. And you know the rangers here that we work with, they all love having him on the patrols, and and he certainly does does help to make things a bit safer and and also more effective. Like our job here is to catch people operating illegally in the jungle, and uh, and he's he's um, certainly started to. Add had his weight there and you know for a dog that's only been with us three months he, he's an amazing animal and we're, we're very blessed to have him oh what a great story so how did you put your SWAT team I'm calling them a SWAT team for endangered species together to uh to save these animals and to do what you're doing who are they and how did you put them together so that was when I made the show I posted on my Facebook page and I went to a couple of sort of online forums that had a few Navy SEALs and that and I, I reached out to I had a couple of friends in the New Zealand SAS which, which is our only tier one military unit and I just put the feelers out and, and had a group of people who sort of came back and, and from that I picked what I thought people who would people who had a conservation bent about them but also those who, who maybe would, would be we good on television and, and I, I took that through until about 2016 and then since then I realised I didn't really need those guys so much and that I'd become really proficient at the illegal fishing side and I'd done so many missions in the jungle and that and, and often there was this awkward thing when I turned up with a bunch of military guys there was this feeling amongst local units 
that we were presenting ourselves as the heroes and mm-hmm. you know we, we were there simply to go helping them not to try and make ourselves as heroes but there was there was sort of some awkward moments and in many ways the rangers that we work with, work with here and, and in the, all the other places that I've worked with the other people putting their lives on the line and we were the lucky ones we would come in and do, do a mission for a month and, and then move on the locals are the ones who were there having to continue dealing with these poachers or illegal loggers or whatever on, on an ongoing basis so in 2016 I pretty much stopped using the military guys uh, and since then I've worked increasingly with the local military units and um, the things we have here we've got the we've got upper the the anti-poaching dog we've got a four million dollar military UAV that's been sponsored by uh, Schiebel in Austria and so we use that to fly surveillance and we pass all the intelligence on to the rangers then we've got a 45 meter ship uh, we've got a rib we've got a zodiac and so what we've become really is a service organization to rangers and these are government rangers in Costa Rica at the moment and so we've signed a one-year agreement with the government here and my team now are pretty much all volunteers and there's the odd military guy amongst them um, but a lot of them are just ordinary people Americans, Brits, Canadians um, French, Spanish just people who want to get involved in conservation And um, I think last week we had 21 people on the boat um, all volunteers and all doing our best to support the rangers and what what is a, an extraordinary environment here like Costa Rica truly is a, a world leader in conservation but they do need help and, and coronavirus and various other things has, has really impacted on the finances here for the ranger teams and we, we're lucky that we can come in here and, and add some value and help them you know help stop illegal logging and wildlife poaching and illegal mining and illegal fishing. Well, what you're sharing with us is truly compelling, and I can see why people want to join you. If you're just joining us, you're listening to Be Bold America on KSQD 90.7 FM. We're speaking with New Zealander Captain Pete Bethune. I'm also here with co-host Pettis Perry. I'm Jill Cody. Hello, K-Squid listeners. I'm Todd Hartman, and each weekday at 4 p.m., I bring you a different perspective on the news than you're likely to hear on most media outlets. Please join me on KSQD Santa Cruz, your ink spot on the dial for the Tom Hartman program. Heard now for the first time ever in the Monterey Bay area at 90.7 FM. Weekdays at 4 p.m. That's progressive talking conversation with me, Tom Hartman. Weekdays at 4 p.m. on KSQD 90.7 FM. Tag, you're it. We're back, and we're speaking with Captain Pete Bethune, founder of the nonprofit Earth Race. And I'd like to encourage you to donate at his earthrace.net website. We can't all be out in the jungles of Costa Rica or in Japanese waters, but he is out in these dangerous locations for us. So I know he'd be grateful for any size donation. Again, visit earthrace.net. So, Captain Pete, I watched a very powerful TEDx talk that you did in Auckland, the TEDx Auckland, and it was titled, Find a Cause Worth Dying For. What were you um, saying? What were you explaining to your audience? I guess the, the, the message I was saying is that if you stand up for a cause in your life, you will lead a richer life. Uh, and I, I just sort of told the stories. And in fact, what happened on that talk was I'd, I'd just been knifed in Brazil a few days earlier, and we'd been following the, the illegal pet trade. And so it did sort of like this, this, my pursuit of conservation had nearly taken my life. And it was a very poignant time. And I went back to New Zealand. I was already, already scheduled in to do this TED talk. And I, I remember I was, it was still quite raw and emotional for me. And when, when I gave the talk, I nearly flagged it away. I remember thinking, I'm just, I just can't be bothered with this. And, and the organizers sort of convinced me. They gave me the last spot on the, on the whole program, which was good of them. And it gave me the most amount of time to try and prepare. And then as I got up to speak, I remember thinking, I'd, I'd cried so much leading up to the talk, and I kind of got cried out. And, and it had become a bit mechanical for me to go doing this talk. And then as I got up, I, I looked in the front of the audience and there was my, my two daughters there. And, um, you know, they, they paid a heavy price for, for my work in ways as well. And uh, in, in some ways it just put me right in the zone and I, I gave a, re- a really good talk that I'm super proud of. 
and um, you know, I, I don't think I could do that talk again. It was just that all the stars lined up for me to give a really powerful talk and to justify why people should stand up for things. And I, I continue with that message today. You know, and people like Peters, for example, he's he's got his cause, and I do believe Peters leads a richer life because of it. And certainly in my case, I've led an extraordinary life over the last 10 or 15 years that I've been able and lucky enough to go following my dreams and following what I'm what I'm passionate about. And, and you know, my cause is conservation and, and I've been truly blessed to do this. And I, I try and encourage people, you don't need to just simply exist. You don't need to buy a house and buy a car and get on this treadmill of car payments and, and pay things off through your life. I, I try and encourage people there's many other ways you can live and you know I'm not telling everyone they need to go and follow conservation I don't not telling them they need to become deadbeats and never have a job but I do believe if people pursue things they're passionate about and especially a cause that's worth standing up for they will lead a better life well when I saw that uh, TED talk it was powerful uh, it was from the heart and it was inspiring and you could tell that it was one of those talks that you couldn't do again. You know, it just was truly inspired. Mm-hmm. Now, Pettis, I've been asking a lot of questions, so uh, have you built up some? Oh, I've always got questions, you <laughs> <laughs> Always, Pettis. You always. brother. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Socrates, man, what can I say? It's the mode I use when I teach, and uh, it's the way I live. You're absolutely right, Pete, about um, having something that's worth dying for uh, or at least risking things that make you comfortable Uh, you know where you have serious skin in the game uh, you begin to live differently uh, as you get into that Uh, and I can attest to that from my own experiences because you put yourself out there in a dangerous place uh, that not everybody is willing to go so you know, I, one of the things, man, that I've really missed ab- about you is not being close and having those conversations, you know, that we would have sitting around the table. Um, but I told you then, and, I'm, you know, I want to make sure that whatever I can do to support you, I want to do that. And I, I told you that then, and, and it's still true. So my question for you is, where do you need help? How can people join your crew or support you? beyond just donations? Yeah, that, that is a good question. The The key thing we need at the moment is competent volunteers to come and help, help us in Costa Rica. Um, and they, the, the vol- my crew, they all pay to be here. They pay, um, depending on the duration, but generally it's three grand they pay and they come on the ship for three months. And they are the backbone of my operation now. And th- these are all people who... who believe in what we're doing and come along and, and but they're from all walks of life I've got engineers, I've got a couple of military people, I've got some admin I've got a social media people um, and you know some people straight out of school you know okay one, one of the things I sort of find with volunteers, there's a, there's a trade happens here Peter so I, they, they pay a few bucks and they come and give me a piece of their life. And in exchange, they get to experience things that they may not necessarily experience. So for example, two days ago, we went went out to Kanyu Island where we're doing maritime patrols at night. Went out in the day and had a whale shark hang with us for about 15 minutes. And he he actually came up, this whale shark came up and, and touched with his mouth the feet of one of my one of my crew who was swimming away from this whale shark because she was quite scared of it <laughs> thinks he's about to be in it so anyway I, so the people that come in and help us they get experiences they would generally not get otherwise and they get to build up a skill set from working with a with an amazing crew of people drawn from around the world and younger speed people especially they can walk away completely changed with a with a really good strong work ethic and having built up some skills be it you know welding or social media or ship operations or how, you know how you might run a maritime patrol at night trying to track illegal fishermen now, I've got one of my crew who's been trained up as a dog handler so myself and one of my crew are the two guys that handle the dog in the jungle um, so anyway to, to back to your point what can people do 
they can go to the website, go to the volunteers page and uh, send me an email. And, um, you know, we're always looking for good, competent volunteers. I do prefer people who have a conservation bent because this boat is hard work. And my, my people on here, I work them pretty hard. And so if you're not really a conservationist, it's not really going to work. Um, so I do want people who believe in conservation and who are motivated to come in and really get stuck into things. Um, and uh, I guess the, the, the other thing people can do is share our social media, like go sharing this, you know, this, uh, this radio interview and sharing our material on Facebook and Instagram. Like those things do help the cause, and our sponsors like to see that our material is, is getting out there. Um, and the other thing I'll say is, you know, people need to think about the choices they make, be it the you know, food they eat and the car they drive and the travel they do, and uh, all of these things play, have, have an impact on the planet. Do you have any equipment needs or anything? Uh, so if anybody owns a business uh, that may be able to donate equipment, is there anything you need? Uh, I could do a, a couple sets of night vision, uh, PVS-14s or better. <laughs> there might be someone listening who has a pair sitting back at home. Uh, always, a, always a need of camo clothing. Um, we, uh, we, we our camo clothes here they get trashed in the jungle here it's always a wet season and uh, the clothing takes a bit of a hammering so, so camo clothing um, and some some hand tools would be nice some grinders if any we go through a lot of grinders on the ship because we're rebuilding everything so if any if someone's got a spare grinder sitting in the back of the garage they can send it down to us I bet you've never had that that request before bro <laughs> uh, so things for the machine shop uh, on the boat and uh, uh, other kinds of specialty equipment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we we've got a we've got a fully equipped workshop here. When I say fully equipped, uh, we, we're always missing the odd things. Like you go through drills, we go through the earmuffs seem to seem to fall to bits and things like that. So you know, stuff to keep the keep the general ship running. Um, yeah, great. Uh, can you uh, share any um, of the upcoming missions? Uh, that you might have or, or uh, something about the way that you go about uh, working with governments without you know sharing too much that might uh, interrupt yeah, your, uh, the, your efforts one of the one of what we started doing so we got this drone donated to us and this is this is a pretty big beast like it's 450 pound fully fully laden and you can fly this thing several hundred miles away and you can have live video coming back to it. It has a thermal camera on it. It has a very powerful um, daylight camera that you can zoom right in. And so what we're starting to do is we're using this to detect where the illegal mines are. So when they do illegal mining in the jungle, they, they always need water to try and separate the gold from the silt. So we fly this UAV over the jungle and we, we spot the turbidity in the water. So this is like when they do the mining, the water gets murky. So if we're seeing, seeing clear water, we know there's no mining upstream. But as you start to see turbid water, as you go upstream, you get closer and closer to where the mine is. So we can use that to to figure out where are likely mines. And it's not always a mine. It can be a slip that's happened recently. But as a general rule, if we see turbid water, there's some people mining upstream. So it allows us to go back to the range and say, here's some points of interest. We think there's mining in this place, this place, this place. Then the mission changes to being how, what's the best way to go in here. And so, so we would have myself and one other dog handler and upper. We would link up with the ranger team and, and go in. And so we've got a series of those projects coming in up and down the Pacific Coast and, and Costa Rica. Uh, and then the other, the other cool one we've got is we're heading out to Cocos Island. And for those of you who don't know Cocos Island, it was the, the original start sequence of Jurassic Park, the, that helicopter shot coming in on that, that beautiful island, that was Cocos Island, and it remains one of the top 10 dive sites in the world. Um, and we're taking a program out there. We've got two things happening. One is there's evidence of illegal fishing boats uh, that are international coming in fishing in the waters around Cocos Island. So they're the number one target is we, we're trying to catch these foreign boats that are fishing legally, uh, and those would be, we would board them with the rangers and bring them back to Costa Rica. Um, but the second part of that, which is quite exciting, is we're taking some scientists out there who are researching plastics in the ocean. And Cocos Island is very remote, and there's been very limited research into plastics out there, but there's anecdotal evidence that Cocos is a real hotspot for the build-up of microplastics. 
Uh, and so we've got a team of scientists and I think a couple of CEOs from businesses involved in the plastics industry who we're taking out to Cocos Island to give them sort of first-hand specific experience of, of where the plastics are ending up. And with that science, you know, one of the problems we have plastics in the ocean is we still don't have the numbers and where are these plastics coming from and what is their build-up, where are they going after they reach a certain size. So we're sort of lucky to be contributing on the on the scientific side of that. And uh, I've only done a little bit of science on this boat. We did a little bit out at Revere Gagato, and, and which is Socorro Island in Mexico. Um, and I enjoy my time with scientists. I find them very interesting people and in conservation science is a necessary part of it to make sure we're making our decisions based on real numbers not emotion and and anecdotal evidence but hard numbers from scientists absolutely um, one other question for you uh, as you you know you approach this work uh, I know you and I've had conversations about you designating your work as conservation uh, rather than uh, as an environmentalist. Um, but it seems like when you start talking about the plastics that you're almost merging the two, or do you see it really as the role of helping to maintain conservation? Yeah, in some ways, the, the research into plastics is it's an add-on because I'm going there. Like, I'm going there to catch foreign boats fishing illegally. Um, how do I fund that? It's very, Costa Rica doesn't have the money to pay me. Like, we, we do this work here for free. Um, but I've got a couple of CEOs who are quite willing to go funding the project if there's some science on board. So in many ways, Pettis, I'm a little bit of a prostitute. I'm, if there's someone willing to pay me to go out there, I'm quite happy to go and do it. I don't want to take a scientist with me, so... I so could have worded that a bit better. Show. <laughs> could have worded that a bit better, I guess. Jill? Yes, well... Um, Let's just do a station ID right now, and then I have some other questions for our uh, Captain Pete. You're listening to Be Bold America on KSQD 90.7 FM, Many Voices, One Station. Listen globally online from the KSQD.org homepage. Want a friend to hear this show later? Tell them to visit their favorite podcast platform. Be Bold America is on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify, to just name a few. I'm your host... Jill Cody. Hi, I'm Amy Goodman, host of Democracy Now! Tune in to our award-winning morning news program right here during primetime, 8 o'clock weekday mornings, right here on K-Squid on KSQD. Our independent news program offers diverse perspectives, unique opinions unheard in the mainstream media, live as the news unfolds. Tune in for Democracy Now!, the War and Peace Report, weekday mornings at 8, right here on KSQD Community Radio, 90.7 FM. Today, our topic is the Indiana Jones of Endangered Species, Captain Pete Bethune. Captain Bethune is the founder of Earth Race. Earth Race is a nonprofit, and at earthrace.net, you may view eye-popping videos of his and his team's work, such as his boat being run over by a Japanese whaling vessel. Oh, and by the way, while you're there, please make a donation. So, Captain Pete, uh, in this last quarter hour... I wanted to kind of drill down on your who-ness some more. Uh, what are some principles that govern your decisions, such as ki kidnapping a dolphin that was illegally held in Indonesia? What is it inside you that says it is the right thing to do? What principles govern your decisions? Jill, that is a, that is a really good question, eh? Um, over the years, I have changed the way that I worked. Um, when, when, I, when I was involved in promoting biofuels, it was just simply a positive promotion. And then my work in Antarctica fighting Japanese whalers was more what I would call activism. And it, and it played a key role in stopping whaling in Antarctica. Um, but after that, I started to see merit in pursuing other causes that needed attention. So, so very often when I'm, when I'm considering a given project, I look at, is it something I can add value in? And I've decided I'm not the right person to, to hold up banners and protests like that. There's other skills that I've got. And so I look at, is this an area that needs attention or does, is it already 
um, is it already well covered in the public domain? And a good example would be the pangolin. Like like when we filmed our episode stopping the wildlife smuggling out of China, out of the Philippines, no one had really heard of a pangolin, and we put it on the map. And then similarly for the the, the Namibian seal clubbing, when our team filmed it and we put that episode on TV, it's, it became this issue that people were suddenly aware about. So I look at is it an issue that's worthy of promotion? Is it is it an issue that my team can add some value in? Uh, and more recently, I've started to realise that I am most effective working with government units. You know, when, you know that's for example stealing the dolphin from a resort in Indonesia, even though technically it was illegal for them to have it. There, the, the law is quite nebulous, and uh, if we had have been arrested there, we would probably still be in prison. And then similarly, exposing the seal clubbing in Namibia, that was illegal, what we did. We broke into an active De Beers diamond mine. Now, if me and my team keep, keep doing those things, sooner or later, I'm going to get rolled up again. And next time, it may not just be five months in a Japanese prison. It might be a much longer stint. So I kind of decided to stop doing the illegal stuff. And that allowed me to link up with, with the company Schiebel in Austria. And Hans, the CEO of Schiebel, he's a good friend of mine, and he said, Bethune, you better stop doing that illegal stuff. I'm giving you this this big military drone. You better be down the straight and narrow now. So, um, and then also, too, I had another guy who came in and, and sponsored a chunk of the ship that I'm on. And we used the ship as the UAV platform. We built a big flight deck on the back sort of thing. So these days, Jill, I'm down the middle. I'm straight and narrow, and I'm working with pretty much government departments so then it becomes a case of which countries do I work with and what do we pursue and given the fact that I've got the drone and the ship that tends to push us into the maritime space but in Costa Rica they've got so many national parks down the specific coastline that we can also go jumping over and doing jungle projects and um, that is illegal uh, illegal mining, illegal logging and wildlife poaching um, and we signed a one year agreement with the government here and that's, that leaves us committed through till the end of this year. And then after that, we'll sit back and see, are there, are there other places I should be going to? We've got an offer to do some work in Colombia, also looking at Ecuador. So, you know, I think we'll, we we may move on at the end of this year or who knows if the government here might, might talk us into, into staying on. Um, but I, I look at Costa Rica, the government here is really willing to work with NGOs like mine. Like they realise they, they can never afford a $4 million UAV. Um, and even the anti poaching dog, like my hope is in the long term they will be able to justify it financially. They'll be able to justify an anti poaching dog. But in many ways, we provide this sort of bridging um, crew to come in and show this is what you can do with a well trained anti poaching dog or a UAV or a you know, a team involved in setting camera traps or acoustic traps or whatever. And it's one of the ways that conservation is changing. Historically, for you to protect a national park, you hired a bunch of guys who were fit, you put a gun in their hands and you sent them out into the jungle or offshore in a boat or whatever. But what's happened recently is that the poaching and all the, the environmental degradation that's happening, it's become so prolific that you can. it's no longer efficient to just do that and to give you an example Corcovado National Park in Costa Rica it is massive it is a big big jungle and for you to expect to be able to catch people who have got cell phones who've got radios who are well resourced and and who, who are very good at evading capture you need to change the game and that is where things like technology like camera traps acoustic traps UAVs anti-poaching dogs that's old school but really got a role to play and you're seeing at the moment that the countries that are doing a good job on conservation, they're changing the game, and 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 we need to. Like if if we don't go changing the way national parks are protected, we will lose them. And and Corcovado, as an example, three percent of the world's biodiversity in a single jungle, and yet it is under siege. Like there are so many people operating illegally in that jungle. And so I, when I looked around, where am I going to work? Costa Rica, the government's very willing to work with us, and they've got this amazing jungle that is truly worth saving, and it is under siege. And so, you know, I decided I'm going to give up a year of my life and and help Costa Rica with their national parks. And after that, you know, there'll be a reevaluation, and and I'll talk to the crew, and we'll we'll figure out where we go to next. When I think of Costa Rica, because I'm a political scientist and I have a background there. I think of them as, you know, they're a functioning democracy and that they have a higher voter turnout rate than the United States does. 
Um, so I can see why they'd be open for partnership with what you're doing. So how did you become you, Captain Pete? What was it in your childhood ex experience that shaped you? Is there something? How did you become you? Yeah, I, I, in my case, I think this is, applies to most people. It has been an evolution. And I, when, when I was young, there was never anything environmental in me. Um, I, I went out and I, I fished a lot. I hunted. I had a father who was extraordinary in taking me and my twin brother and a younger brother out, and we would go eeling or fishing or we'd chase rabbits, we'd go camping, we'd do a lot of outdoors. And that, that, that's very common in New Zealand. Most, most New Zealanders, you know, as kids, especially if you live in a rural area or semi-rural, you spend your time outdoors. And uh, so, But in, in those days, it was simply exploitation. Of, of New Zealand natural environment. We would just go and hunt rabbits or possums or whatever it was that we wanted to eat or in the case of the possums and you, possums in New Zealand are a big pest we would we would skin them and sell the pouts and I was I was me and my twin brother we were the wealthiest kids in our school from from hunting possums and selling them and so so even though I was exploitative of the environment it gave me an appreciation. Like I've, I spent countless nights in New Zealand camping out in the bush with my twin brother. And as we got older, we started hunting more pigs and deer and, and goats and other things. And then as I started to travel overseas and gradually got involved in conservation, I started, it, it, I've always had that appreciation of these jungle areas and bush areas and things like that. But in terms of me working in conservation, it has been this gradual journey. And the start of it was, I, in fact, I, my early days are very non-environmental. I spent about seven or eight years in the oil industry, and I made a. I was earning about a quarter of a million dollars in the hand a year, um, and all I cared about was making money. And and what happened at the end of my time in that industry, I started looking at the other engineers who I was working with, and I started to see them as very very sort of one-dimensional people like they cared about money and they cared about their Colombian or Venezuelan wife and I thought of them I sort of remember thinking I don't want to end up like these guys like all they cared about was, was money um, and so I went back to New Zealand got married had a, had a couple of kids and but I started having this interest in renewable fuels partly because of my experience in the oil industry gave me this 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 understanding of what a very finite resource it is and gradually issues of climate change and other things came in so my journey into conservation really started when I was I was in Australia doing an MBA to complete the degree I wrote a 20,000 word project alternative fuels for road transport and that opened my eyes to biodiesel uh, and after that I then built that very cool boat called Earth Race we set a record to circle the globe running biodiesel made from waste cooking oils and I go back to my point earlier once you get to work on things you really believe in very hard to, to turn back and what's happened from then is I've just evolved into promoting biofuels uh, to running a TV show where uh, or the, then there was the anti-whaling activities in Antarctica then had my own television show to fund my work and then in more recent times um, working with government units and getting funded by donations and volunteers that, that want to come and help out on our team um, so there's, there, I don't think Jill there was ever a real turning point there's, there's just been this gradual evolution into pursuing things I believe in and what I believe in has changed you know, I, I pursued biodiesel for, biodiesel for a period and then I got involved in marine conservation and now conservation on, on land as well. Um, you just have a stunning background and I wanted to get to know uh, who you were as a person, your being, and that. thank you so much for sharing that, Captain Pete. Well, this is sort of the time when we go into asking... Uh, what listeners could keep doing, stop doing, and start doing to help your cause, to assist you. What, you know, and all these causes from the, um, um, you know, the illegal fishing and everything that you talked about, what we in California can do, what people who listen worldwide on the podcast here, what, what can listeners keep doing, stop doing, and start doing that support your I'm causes? I think in terms of in terms of your listeners, if the best thing you can do to help the planet is to have fewer babies. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying have no babies, mm -hmm. but the planet pays a heavy price for every one of us. So you can have fewer babies, eat less meat, and eat less dairy. The world pays a heavy price 
for meat and dairy. And I, our ship, I encourage our crew is not compulsory, but I do encourage my crew eat less meat and eat, eat less dairy. Um, we're always looking for volunteers and uh, you know people who are passionate about conservation. Uh, they can go onto the website, look at the volunteer page, look at the Costa Rica page, look at what we're doing. If they think that they might be able to come in and help out, um, then you know send me an email or send me a WhatsApp message. Um, and in terms of donations, I, when I got bitten by that snake, like it nearly took my life. I was two weeks in hospital. I've got a $32,000 hospital bill. Uh, we've paid off about 20 grand. I've still got another 12 grand to pay. Uh, if people want to donate, uh, they can help me pay my hospital bill. Um, and uh, we, we're always looking for money, like like all conservation NGOs. You you know, it's mm-hmm. the hardest thing. I'll, I'll tell you something that happens. One of the problems we have is our clients don't have money, and so we need to find a way we can package it so that people support us. And I did that for a period with the television show, but you're saving whales or saving the pangolin or, or saving fish in a creek from illegal mining. They don't have any money to pay you, and that's the challenge in conservation. How are you going to fund your work? and um, it's, it's not an easy thing to solve. Well, as I mentioned, that you're out in the jungles of Costa Rica or wherever you find your, yourself in this world uh, and doing dangerous things in dangerous locations for, for all of us and on behalf of us, and I want to thank you for that and encourage people who do listen um, to check the website at earthrace.net and to donate. Pettis, did you have any quick last-minute uh, question? Um, more of a comment, uh, Pete. I, I want to say thank you uh, for allowing me to work with you for as long as we work together. Um, you made a significant impact, and the work that you're doing uh, is just so important for the planet. Uh, and it's great that you're giving people an opportunity to actually get their hands dirty, to get in, and to help you do the work, because that's really how people learn it. Uh, is there anything uh, that you want to leave us with that we might not have covered? Uh, no, I don't think so, Peter. Look, I, I appreciate your guys' time, and you know, I, I remember you were a fantastic volunteer for us when we were back in Bramerton, and you know, the, that time you spent on the ship with us, I, I, I cherish that time we, we shared together, and it's been great following you on your journey where, you, where you're going, and you know, I'm very lucky to get to work with with people like you and and Jill. You know, thanks so much for having us on your show. I don't take these opportunities for granted, and I'm, I'm very blessed that that you guys give us a platform to come on and, and tell people what we're up to. So just appreciate it, and, and thanks very much. Uh. Well, Pete, you, you live a dramatic and compelling life and an inspiring one. I know that this podcast um, will be heard around the world, and I hope you're able to share it as well. I'll be sending you your own copy. <laughs> so thank you for what you do, uh, Captain Pete Bethune. It's been an honor speaking with you. Um, I want to thank Be Bold America's program engineer, Christine Barrington, and Howard Feldstein, KSQD's program director, and give another big thank you to today's terrific and very bold guest, Captain Pete Bethune, Earth Race founder and who is an example of someone bravely living a principle-centered life. You're listening to KSQD 90.7 FM, Santa Cruz, Many Voices, One Station. Listen worldwide online at ksqd.org. My name is Jill Cody. And I'm Dr. Pettis Perry. Thank you for listening to Be Bold America. Until next time, keep, stop, start.